In this final lecture, we're going to look at some of the murky world of psychological science in which biases and errors and f even fraud can lead us to question the conclusions of at least some psychological science. So in the previous lecture, you looked at the philosophy of science and how, in theory at least, psychology should proceed, testing hypotheses, trying to confirm or falsify hypotheses, and you looked at some of the ideals of how science is done. So in this final lecture, we're going to ask whether modern psychology really does follow those ideals of scientific inquiry, and can we look at modern psychology as a good example of a scientific inquiry? There's a bit of a warning here because um, some of the material in this lecture is quite thought-provoking um, and quite worrying, actually. So the learning objectives for this lecture are to describe how modern scientific practice may be biased or inadequate, particularly in psychology, to discuss and evaluate the possible causes for this scientific mispractice that we're going to identify, and then to describe and evaluate some potential solutions for how we might improve science in the future. Now for this lecture I, uh, I read a couple of books, they're both very recent, uh, and I've used these two books, and they cover a lot of the same ground, so they, they are really good, a good pair of books to, to work from. Um, and I've printed some chapters of these books in the materials for the lecture. And so the first part of this lecture is structured around these two books, both on what we're going to call the replication crisis, and we'll talk more about that later. So Chris Chambers, in his book in 2017, talks about the seven deadly sins of psychology. And he lists seven domains of study or practice where things are not quite the way they should be. And in his book, which was out just in March of this year, Stuart Ritchie does a very similar thing, but he looks a bit wider across science in general, and he looks for evidence of fraud, bias, negligence, and hype. Both of these books cover a period almost entirely in, focused in the last 10 years, so since about 2011. And both books were inspired by one particular paper, and we're going to look at that paper right now. There was a paper in 2011 by Daryl Benn, and it made the extraordinary claim that human participants in a psychology experiment can predict the future. And in this experiment, he reversed the typical series of stimulus and response. So in psychology, you're very used to presenting people with a stimulus and then asking them to respond one way or the other, to choose one of two responses for a particular stimulus. Now ben was trying to investigate the phenomenon of extrasensory perception or prediction, predicting the future, and um, he just reversed the order of presentation. So he first asked people to make a choice, to push one of two buttons, a left button or a right button, and based on that choice, he would then show them a picture. Now at the time they made the decision, they didn't know what the two pictures were going to be, the two possible pictures. So they just chose a left button or a right button, and then a picture would follow. And the remarkable thing in Bem's experiment then was that he reported participants chose erotic pictures, so pictures of a sexual nature, 53.1% of the time. So the chance level is 50%. So this is a little bit above chance if you were just guessing randomly, but it was significantly above chance. 53.1% in this case was significantly above chance, and the p-value there is 0.01%. And these erotic pictures were mixed up with negative or neutral or positive or romantic but non-erotic pictures. And so it seemed in this experiment that his subjects were choosing slightly better than chance to see the erotic picture. So they would push a left button and 53% of the time an erotic picture would come up. Or they'd push the right button and 53% of the time an erotic picture would come up. So they would choosing, even though the stimuli were randomised, they were sort of choosing to see something in the future. Now, this this is problematic because uh, laws of physics and uh, everything we know about the brain and psychology and science in general says that this shouldn't be possible. And indeed, there, are, there have been many, many attempts to try and show that people have powers for predicting the impossible and predicting the future in the past. And they've all failed. Every single experiment has failed. So why did this one somehow succeed? Now this paper, like several other of the papers we've chosen to, to use in this course as examples, this paper caused a lot of controversy. A lot of people just read the paper and thought, no, this is impossible. 
how and why are these results coming out this way? And because of it, it's an extraordinary claim, people made the reasonable suggestion that you should have extraordinarily good evidence if you're trying to show that human participants can predict the future. So it turns out that we almost certainly can't predict the future. And the main critique first came from uh, Wagenmakers et al. in 2011, the same year. They quickly wrote uh, a, a criticism of the BEM paper. I'm just going to list some of the explanations that they gave why that why it could be possible to run an experiment with these very sort of impossible sounding hypotheses yet find supporting evidence. So Wagenmakers et al questioned for example in experiment one why was it only that erotic pictures are not positive or negative or neutral or romantic? Why only erotic pictures resulted in significant prediction? Had they hypothesized that it would be only erotic pictures? Or was that completely an unexpected sort of post hoc finding? In their third experiment, they did, I mean, they published nine experiments, I think, in this report with something like a thousand participants. So it was a very big experiment. In their third experiment, Wagenmakers pointed out that they used different data processing steps, that different steps than they'd used in, in previous experiments. And it wasn't clear why in this particular experiment they'd used a particular kind of data processing. In experiment five, they asked why was it only women who showed the effects and why in that case only with negative pictures? Was there a hypothesis that men and women should show differences in their ability to predict the future? And there wasn't. In, in the paper, Ben said explicitly there was no reason to predict a difference between men and women. And then in a sixth experiment, um, the criticism was raised. Why did you only find it after 10 stimuli had been presented in a row, some sort of exposure effect? Um, why not after four, six or eight stimuli? So you can see with these four criticisms of four separate experiments, they're different criticisms. So why, why was it particular to the stimulus? Why was it particular to the data processing? Why was it particular to the subjects? And why was it particular to the particular trials that, that occurred in the experiments? And each of one of these is different. And uh, quite neatly, um, Wagenmakers et al. read previous examples from Ben's papers. And in 2000, Bem said, and I'll quote this at length because it's quite fun. Let us become intimately familiar with the data. Examine them from every angle. Analyse the sexes separately. Make up new composite indices. If you see dim traces of interesting patterns, try to reorganise the data to bring them into bolder relief. If there are participants you don't like, or trials, observers or interviewers who gave you anomalous results, Place them aside temporarily and see if any coherent patterns emerge. Go on a fishing expedition for something, anything interesting. Now this is not good practice. And the rest of this lecture really is examining why this is not good practice and the other kinds of practice that, that psychologists tend to get up to, but which isn't good scientific practice. So in case it wasn't obvious so far, you really should not do the kinds of things that Bem said he did or encouraged his researchers to do. But it probably is the case that many scientists, many psychologists, still do and certainly have done this sort of thing in the past. So can we analyse this problem in more detail and can we find solutions to these problems? Hopefully yes, and that's the aim of the rest of the lecture. Now I just want just to explain what the problem is so far is that Bem was testing an impossible sounding hypothesis that no one else had ever shown any evidence for. He did nine experiments. In each of those experiments, the results were slightly different. So only in women in one, only with particular trial numbers in another, only with particular stimuli in another. And the idea really is that there is almost certainly no evidence that people can predict the future. But if you look hard enough, if you keep analyzing and reanalyzing your data you will find something that looks like it will confirm your original hypothesis and the trick is to recognize this and then try and protect against it. So I've drawn on two books both recent and both very relevant to this question this problem. The first is by Chris Chambers he's an Australian scientist now working in Cardiff and he's best known over the last five years or so for introducing registered reports as a publication format and we'll talk a lot more about that later. And in Chris Chambers's book, he lists seven sins 
seven deadly sins that psychology and psychology researchers are guilty of. The first is the sin of bias. That's sin number one. And I'm going to refer to these as uh, hash S1. So if you see S1 written like that um, in the rest of the lecture, I'm referring to Chris Chambers' book because there's too many references to, uh, to catch them all. So I'm just abbreviating them as sin number one, S1. And that's bias. And that's the idea that we're more likely to, to see things we already agree with. We're more likely to look for things that, that, that are more favourable to ourselves. We're, we're not objective independent observers when we run experiments. The second sin is hidden flexibility and this is the idea that there are many stages of analysis and processing and selection and filtering that go on between running an experiment and publishing a paper and very few of these many many stages end up actually being written in in the scientific paper. So a lot of the process of, of collecting and curating data is hidden from the eventual reader. The third sin is unreliability, and that's essentially that our experiments just aren't good enough. Um, they're too variable, they may have too few participants or too few data points, they may not repeat or replicate very well, and they may, they may not relate very well to the things we're really trying to study. The fourth of Chambers' sins is data hoarding. This is the very common problem that um, data that, that lie behind experiments and, and papers and books aren't made available to the general public. So they sit on a scientist's computer maybe for years or decades. Uh, when the paper gets published, there'll be some sort of document available online, which you might have to buy. But the data, the raw data, probably still on that psychologist's computer. And that computer will at some point be thrown away or the psychologist will change careers or die. And the data are lost. So we need to be better at protecting our data and making our data available. The fifth sin is corruptibility, and that's the problem that uh, even scientists can be corrupt. They can cheat, they can steal, they can um, yeah, they can make up data and commit fraud. And we'll look at a few cases of fraud. The sin of internment, number six, expresses the idea that even after publication of these articles that come from these data that we don't share, uh, the articles themselves are quite hard to get access to if you're just a general member of the public. And finally, the sin of beam counting is um, just trying to put a number to everything. So trying to measure the quality of people's science by, by numbers that don't really represent the things you're trying to measure. So trying to measure science with bad numbers, that's beam counting. The second book, slightly more recent, but covers much of the same um, topic, is written by Stuart Ritchie. Now he works on intelligence. Uh, so lecture three, he's, he's looked at um, Stephen Jay Gould's work and the uh, intelligence testing controversies. So he's he's been working in a controversial research field, which, which will produce lots of interesting uh, subject matter for a book. And unlike uh, Chris Chambers' book, Stuart Ritchie digs a bit deeper into different kinds of science and also deeper into history. So he goes a bit further back and he looks at biology and anthropology and other, other topics as well as psychology. And Ritchie's book is organised by these four topics. Fraud, which is fiction one, and I'm going to call that F1 in the, in the next few lectures. Bias, so that's the same sort of thing I'm talking about in Chambers' book, the, uh, the sort of relatively subtle biases and uh, effects that we exert on our own data. Negligence, that's basically making mistakes um, and not correcting them or uh, not being very good at science in the first place. And then hype, which is an interesting one, which is trying to exaggerate or sell or spin your your results so that sort of you're claiming more than your results actually tell you. Now linking to last week's lecture that you had with Richard, Ritchie uses Merton's 1973 system of the four values of science to frame his arguments. Um, and if I remember them, that's um, communality, disinterestedness, organised scepticism and universalism. So if you can't remember those, uh, look them up in last week's lecture materials. And that's the way that Richie has framed his book on the topic. So what I've done for this lecture, first I've, I've read those two books and they were great fun over the last couple of weeks. Um, and I'm going to try and present what I've learned from those books and what else I know from my own experience in psychological science. Um, and I'm going to present them in four sections overall, which um, match up pretty closely to, to some of the chapters in those two books. So the first part we're going to deal with is bias. The second part is error in science. 
third part is spin, and that's the being political, exaggerating your claims. And the fourth part is treachery or um, fraud, essentially. And the reason I've chosen these four words is just so I can create a nice acronym best there. So you could try and name these four sections yourself and come up with your own uh, acronym to help you remember. So first, let's talk about bias. For each of these sections, I've put a little uh, sort of logical conundrum at the top um, where I just sort of re I just re-emphasize the fact that scientists are human. So if, if we know that humans are biased, that humans are irrational, emotional and selfish, that they're not good decision makers, they're not good thinkers, then because scientists are also human, we should really expect to see bias in science. Science is done by human. And, and Stuart Ritchie opens his book by saying that science is a social construct and we just cannot get around that. So the point of this lecture is to help you identify the problems in science, and they're mostly problems of scientists, and then try and fix them. So in this section on biases, I'm going to mention four biases. The first is confirmation bias. Now it's come up a couple of times in the lecture series already, and it's quite a common phenomenon now. I think the media are talking about confirmation bias quite a lot. And if you want to read something on this, there's this fantastic long article by Nickerson 20 years ago, um, and he looks at all of the examples he can find in the psychological literature as well as in wider society. And confirmation bias is essentially that we are far more readily willing to to look for, to find and to agree with things that support our already favoured hypotheses. So if we already think it, it's much easier for us to take on additional facts which support that view. And with social media and political polarisation and all of the problems that we see in the modern world, confirmation bias is clearly one of the most powerful forces at work in, in society. And psychology has a strong role to, to try and understand this. So scientists are humans, so scientists engage in confirmation bias all the time. Uh, a scientist is looking for evidence that supports his or her hypothesis. They're, they're, they're actually rarely looking to try and falsify it because maybe maybe their career depends on, on the hypothesis being supported. Another kind of bias is a novelty bias. So we seem to like new things or positive ideas and positive findings. And we find those more persuasive and more interesting than old ideas or negative findings. And what I mean by positive finding is basically a significant, a statistically significant finding. So we're more interested in finding out that two things are different than finding out that they're the same or that, that one variable causes another variable or one, one variable is correlated with another variable. We like talking about positive ideas more than negative or the absence of things. The third bias is hindsight bias. And this is changing how you remember things or changing how you remember your predictions or, or events in the past based on new information based on that. So if you look back, uh, you might think, oh yes, I always wanted to become a become an academic. That was my that was my really my calling in life. Everything from a uh, everything from a young child, I was I was uh, going to become an academic. It's not true. I wanted to be an airline pilot, an actuary, a basketball player, you know, a train driver, all those things. So hindsight bias is looking back on things. You sort of change the way you remember, and in science, that's there's a word for it since uh, Kerr in 1998, and in that paper they or he, he or she pointed out um, that we do this all the time, scientists do this, and it's called harking now. So it's called hypothesizing after the results are known. This is an acronym which is quite useful. So to hark is essentially to write a paper and then at, at the beginning and the end of the paper you change your hypotheses um, as if you always had those hypotheses all along. So it doesn't matter what you find in your in your research, you can just change the hypotheses at the end uh, to match what you found. So it looks like you always were looking for that thing. And that's not OK. And I've been asked by um, by journal reviewers to, to do that. And, and many people have been asked in, in the past to change the hypotheses to, to fit the data that they're presenting because it, it makes a nicer story. So these first three biases uh, mostly affect individuals, um, but they also come up in the in the publication process. So when we try and submit ideas to journals, um, journals tend to like uh, things that support, things that are new, positive, 
and things that tell a clear story. So there's a publication bias and that the, the journals and the academic publishers help these biases all along by basically refusing to publish things which aren't novel and aren't consistent and aren't clear and aren't sort of confirmatory. So this publication bias feeds on and grows but also amplifies all the biases that we have as scientists. The second of our four problems in psychological science is error. I should say that, you know, this isn't just psychological science. All of these things really apply to all, all science, but we're on a psychology course, so we're going to stick to the psychological examples. So to put this in my little pithy saying at the top, uh, humans are fallible, scientists are human, therefore scientists are fallible. And the typical things that that people look at when thinking about how psychological science has gone wrong or could be better are the four things here, four kinds of errors. So the first, and it's a pretty big one, is when we design studies, we typically don't have enough power, statistical power in our studies. And what that means is the data are too variable or we have too few subjects, participants, too few data points, or we have a poorly calibrated measurement device or we have a poorly designed questionnaire. And because of this high variability, low sample sizes and low statistical power, this leads us to make the wrong conclusions from our data. So we incorrectly reject the null hypothesis or we incorrectly sort of find some evidence in favour of, of the alternative hypothesis. So these kinds of errors that we make are caused by low powered studies. A second major problem in psychology is that of statistics. Now, statistical reasoning is not easy and it's often counterintuitive. And over my teaching in the last 10 years, I've done a couple of um, surveys of scientists, psychologists in, in lecture theatres with staff and PhD students and master's students. And I asked them a question, can you, can you define the p-value? And even in, a, in, a, in an alternative, for alternative forced choice, sort of a multiple choice question, the majority of scientists don't get this right. They don't know and they don't they're unable to correctly define a p-value. Now, p-values are one of the most commonly reported statistical numbers in, in science, and particularly in psychology. We teach about p-values, we put them in our first year materials for uh, psychology undergraduate degrees. We probably deal with thousands of p-values during our career, but it's rather striking that most scientists can't do correctly define what it is. And there's a lot of statistical issues in this lecture and a lot of things that um, that we could go much further into if this was a statistics course. It's not. It's a conceptual and historical issues course. So I'm not going to go too far into these statistical issues. Um, but trust me, there is a real problem, both with the teaching of statistics in, in much of psychological science, but even more so with the understanding and the reasoning about statistics in, in scientists and psychologists as a whole. So third kind of very simple error is just mistakes. Things that are missing from the methods section, typos, putting down the wrong p-value, all that sort of stuff. So often you can find your way around it or you can ask the authors if they're still available. Um, but sometimes these small typos can have large implications. If something looks a bit wrong, you should never really just assume that it's, it's right, even if it's written in a, in a paper or a, a book. You know, there can always be errors. And another major one, a major problem with psychology in particular, I think, is that we don't tend to do the same experiment twice. We don't tend to confirm our own experiments. We don't tend to try and disconfirm them either. We don't try and tend to confirm or disconfirm other people's experiments. And we tend not to revise our previous work or retract our problematic papers. So in general, we have this sort of blindness to our own, the quality of our own science. And this is this causes lots of mistakes, things that are in the in the published literature which should never be there. The third of our four problems for this first part is spin, and this is the the hyperbole, the hype. Humans bend the rules, stretch the truth, and tell little white lies. And scientists are also human, therefore they do the same thing. So, what kind of spin and hype can we see in psychological science? In many ways, this is the main problem of the last 10 years that, that we've been looking at in, psych, in psychology and science more generally. So I've, I've bundled together a few things in here and I'm calling them all spin and hype because essentially it's um, you take a data set and you're, you, maybe what you've got is not what you wanted. And so you, you change the data set or you change the conclusions that you, 
we try and draw from those data. So in analysing a new data set for a particular experiment, the researcher has many different choices that they could make, many different little possible tweaks, slightly different ways to analyse the data. Do you do a series of t-tests or an ANOVA? Do you do a, a parametric correlation or a non-parametric correlation? All these sorts of things. There are lots of choices available. And if you sort of combine all of the choices, you end up having uh, hundreds or thousands of different possibilities for, that you could take for analysing a single data set. And so this sort of flexibility is a problem if it's not reported or, or not understood by the researcher. And related to this, if you do 20 different tests on the same data set, if they're independent tests, then the chances are that one of those tests is going to come up with a significant effect for you. So if you do 20, you'll find a significant effect. Uh, and then if you just write about that one test that you found that was significant, then you're biasing your, your conclusions, you're spinning the conclusions. You should really talk about all 20 tests. And this, all of these, these two things lead to something that's been called p-hacking. So p is the famous p-value that we all want to be below 0 0.05, so we can say that we've found something. And p-hacking is the, the problematic practice that you keep trying different analysis methods or slightly different tweaks to your data set until you find a, a significant p-value. And once you've found that, that p-value, you then stop. You don't carry on looking for, for more for, for more lower p-values. So this is a problem because if you just keep going and keep trying different things, at some point you should be able to find something that looks significant. A fourth kind of spin or uh, double dipping it's called, is uh, when you take a data set and you run two analyses, but the, the first analysis is used to select some data. For example, you want to find where, where subjects did better in one condition than, a, than another condition. But the second analysis does a second kind of sets of tests on those already selected data. Now, it's a bit tricky to get into the stats of all this, but essentially, if those two analyses are not independent from each other, so if they're correlated with each other, then there's a problem. So you select data in a first analysis, and then you run a second related analysis on those selected data. That's a problem. And this is extremely common. And together, these four things, plus several others, have, been, have come to be known as questionable research practices. That's QRPs. And they're essentially ways of making your data look or sound better than they really are. By doing multiple different things, by analysing them in different ways, you can create better looking data and then you can tell a better story about those things. And this is not good practice. In the final few slides, I want to talk about fraud and treachery. Now, all of the previous stuff that I've been talking about, I think it's fair to say that almost everyone would do this at some point in their career, but they probably wouldn't be aware of it. It would sort of be unconscious bias, or it would be accidentally tweaking their data in ways that they didn't understand. And only when you really understand it can you then try and stop yourself doing it. But there's a line between uh, sort of normal day-to-day -day stuff that people tend to do but may not realise that there are statistical problems, uh, and then there's just plain fraud. So we know that humans fabricate, lie, cheat, steal and break the rules. And we know that scientists are humans, therefore we should expect scientists also to do a bit of fraud now and again. And so let's just look at a couple of uh, cases in psychology where people have been found doing fraud. So they've been caught and then they've lost their jobs. Diedrich Staple was a, a classic case. This is again but from about 2011, 2012. And it turns out, he's a social psychologist, and it turns out that he had made up the data of 58 different studies and articles in social psychology. So he published 58 papers, and most of the data are suspect in some way. And he admitted to this. He wrote a book about it even. He would sit at home on his kitchen table or in his lab, just making up the numbers, just literally making them up. Um, he lost his job and he was fired, of course, for that fraud. I think he was uh, prosecuted as well, and he got a, 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 a suspended prison sentence. So it was uh, illegal because it's a kind of fraud. You're misusing public funds. You are uh, lying. You're making false claims. You're breaking copyright agreements, all sorts of things. It's, it's a really serious problem, and he was rightly punished. 
there's lots of other cases um, and Ritchie and uh, Chambers both come out with uh, these these cases. So one of Sanna and Smeesters, and they were found out by by some sort of data detective. Someone just didn't really believe the 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 two two good looking data sets in in their articles. They found too many similarities between data sets. The means are too similar, or the standard deviations are too similar. And a trained scientist can sort of do quite well at spotting things that don't look quite right. And an article was written about uh, Sanna and Smeesters. That's the one cited at the bottom there. And following the article, uh, these these two researchers resigned from their jobs. The final one, not quite in psychology, but uh, using questionnaire methods about um, human behaviour and political opinions. Um, Lacour essentially made up data. He was a PhD student, made up data on people's opinions about gay rights and the gay rights movement, I think, in America. And essentially, he'd just taken a previous survey and then sort of moved the data around a little bit. But it was entirely made up. This, his new survey never happened. Um, the data were published and then retracted. Uh, and Lacour never never got his PhD and never, never went in to become a scientist. So there are three examples of clearly psychological research over the last 10 years or so. And three is not too many. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of papers in psychology in that time. Um, so three may not be too bad. But these are the ones, remember, that were caught. Uh, and they were obviously not very good at making up their data. <laughs> so we do wonder how many uncaught data frauds are out there. We don't know. And it's not just a problem in psychology, of course. So here is a fantastic example from biology. And I've referred to uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bick here. She's um, Dutch and she used to work in a lab um, looking at these sorts of images. And she has now become uh, a essentially a data detective. She set up a consultancy and she discovers frauds that have been uh, perpetrated in the biochemical and, and um, biopharmaceutical industry. So this image with these red and green uh, streaks on them is supposed to be his heart tissue and it's had a staining. I think it's looking for some of the heart heart damage. Now, if you have a look at these images carefully, can you see anything strange? Well, I'll let you have a look um, in the meantime. Uh, so Elizabeth Bick noticed some problems in these sorts of images and she started uh, systematically scanning them. And then she wrote a paper in 2016 where in that one paper alone, she looked at 20,000 images like this and analysed them just visually using her brain and her eyes uh, for signs of error and fraud. And she found rather um, startling results. And in case you've been worrying about the uh, any problems with this particular image, so what I've done with the two images from the previous slide is I've just magnified them a bit. I've cropped them. Uh, so image A is now on the left and image B is now on the right. But image B, I've also um, flipped top to bottom. Uh, and it looks this, you know, overall, they look uh, pretty similar. And the contrast, I think, and the coloration has been changed in the images. But I think you can see that the image on the left is basically the same as the image on the right. So this was a published image in a biomedical journal talking about damage to heart tissue. And all three of those images, A, B and C, were from the same image. They were just rotated and the colours changed slightly and the, the focus moved a little bit. So this is image duplication and this is fraud. This is pretending that two different images, supposedly from control groups or different kind of treatment groups, supposedly, the, supposedly different groups, but actually the same image and just basic fraud. So Elizabeth Beck has set herself up as a uh, data consultant, so you can uh, employ her for various various scientific needs. And um, she tweets all of her images on uh, on Twitter, and it's, it's quite fun trying to spot the images. She'll post an image, and then within the next uh, few minutes and hours, various other scientists will have a go and, and see if they can find the problems. She's posted hundreds of images over the years. And overall, in her paper, she, sat, she found that 4% of all the images in the articles she looked at contained evidence of error or fraud. And that seems to me unacceptably high. In my final slide, I want to make a uh, bit of a political speech, I suppose. Obviously, we're currently in the world looking for a, a vaccine for coronavirus, one of these horrible um, diseases that has caused such chaos throughout the world. Now, vaccination is going to be essential many people in the world are going to need to be vaccinated in the next few months. And 20 years ago, in Britain, there was a doctor, a disgraced fraud 
doctor, Mr. Andrew Wakefield, and who published a link, uh, a possible link in a paper between a particular vaccination that we have in Britain and elsewhere against measles, mumps and rubella and autism. And the reason I put this example in is because it's about autism and lots of people in psychology are interested in studying autism. But we're also interested in why people fear vaccinations, why people might have or not have vaccinations. But in the last 20 years, there's been a really a real decrease in the number of people who, who take up vaccination. And particularly the last 10 years, as this graph uh, from the Guardian newspaper shows, the yellow line there is the number of people who've taken up the MMR vaccination in the last year. So we're down to about 90%. It's not enough. It needs to be 95 So in Andrew Wakefield's paper, he said there was a link between the vaccination and autism. But in that paper, he made at least five scientific frauds. So he changed some of the details about each of his 12 patients so that the story was more consistent. He also invented the fact that all 12 children experienced their first autism symptoms after having the MMR vaccination. They didn't. Some were before, some were after, some were never diagnosed with autism. So he didn't mention this. He ignored the fact that some of these 12 children were never diagnosed with autism. Worse, and the reason, one of the several reasons that he was later struck off as a, a medical doctor, he can, he's no longer allowed to be a doctor, he concealed the fact that he was being paid by a lawyer to help to sue some vaccine manufacturers. So he was financially involved in a court case against a particular kind of vaccine manufacturers. And then he published his paper saying that these vaccines were bad. He also concealed the fact that he had financial interests in an alternative vaccine. So this is a single scientific paper on 12 children relating MMR vaccination to autism. And he is seen as a hero of the anti-vaccination movement by millions of people in America and, and Europe and across the world. Yet the paper was a fundamental fraud from the beginning. And it's very hard to imagine or estimate how many children across the world will have died unnecessarily from the preventable diseases that um, these vaccinations have been designed to prevent. So my little political speech over. Um, yes, we should always be wary of medical interventions. Yes, we should always be sceptical. But more importantly, we should be sceptical of the scientists who commit these sorts of frauds. We need to be wary. We need to, be, we need to watch out for this sort of stuff. So as I said at the beginning, uh, Ritchie says that science is a social construct, and it really is. All scientists are human. All of us are biased. Most will make mistakes, will exaggerate. Some of us are going to cheat. And we've all got to hope for the best conduct in, in scientists, but we should still remain careful and cautious uh, and expect that some will behave really badly. But why on earth would any scientists do this? Stay tuned, find out next lecture. If you have any questions, uh, put them in the Q&A 